so this morning I want to talk to you about uh, malaria and a little bit specifically about what changes we've made in terms of affecting the outcome of what remains one of the top three infectious killers in the world. We've just dealt with the other two, uh, well, not the other two in terms of tuberculosis. Okay, so I want to start, though, by uh, talking about what we mean by severe malaria. And I think it's important uh, to note the, that the definition is from the uh, second edition WHO guidelines on the management of malaria. In a patient with uh, plasmodium falciparum asexual parasitemia and no other obvious cause of the symptoms, you only need the presence of one of several clinical and laboratory features in order to make the clinical diagnosis of severe malaria. The uh, clinical fe features uh, are many, and it uh, speaks to the fact that malaria is a multi-system disorder. Uh, and again, there's quite a few laboratory findings as well. I think one of the things to bear in mind, though, is that the definition as it's been um, decided is one that's aimed at being very sensitive. <clears throat> we don't want to miss patients with severe malaria. However, it's not very specific. Okay, so uh, this is something I came across a little while ago. It was a, a letter published in The Lancet in the year 2010, and it seemed to answer the, the topic of my, my talk quite nicely. Uh, for severe malaria, artisanate is the answer. So maybe if the other speakers need more time, I can probably sit down. I don't, I don't think so, though. Uh, malaria is a very complicated disease. The management of it is very complicated. But this is a principle which I think is very simple. And, and, it, and it, it almost looks like a, a mathematical equation. You have malaria. And some people with malaria will go on to have severe malaria. The truth is, only about 1% <clears throat> of total malaria cases will progress on to severe malaria. So <clears throat> what's the role for critical care in all of this? Do we come in here at the management only of severe malaria, or is there a role for us earlier? I'm worried that if we limit our, our intervention as healthcare workers, maybe not as critical care people, <laughs> just to severe malaria, we, we're going to end up with a problem. Uh, I'm going to speak about myself, and I'm going to leave it to the rest of you to, to acknowledge in your own minds that sometimes we tend to look at other doctors as being single organ doctors, and we shake our heads at them. Are we in danger of becoming single patient doctors? Uh, I'm a bit worried about it. I mean, what is the problem we're dealing with? Malaria affects a huge chunk of the world. I mean, obviously, it's all centered around the equator. Uh, but more importantly, affects a huge chunk of the developing world. <clears throat> in, in about the mid, uh, about 2005, established figures put out that we had about 500 million cases of malaria worldwide. And of those 500 million cases, we had about a million deaths annually. And that equated to about 2,800 deaths a day. So this was a massive problem, and fortunately, some of the non-single patient doctors and people involved in healthcare got together and set about putting interventions in place to address this problem. And some of the things that have worked particularly well in Africa have been scaling up of vector control measures, so the placement of insecticide treated bed nets, uh, residual spraying, community case management, and even intermittent pre preventative therapy, and together with a wide scale rollout of artemisin combination therapy. And that has had a significant impact. What we're talking about is that we've halved the number of cases of malaria worldwide, and we've dropped mortality rates by about 30%. And that's, that's 300,000 deaths per year. However, we're still left with a situation of about 2,000 people dying of malaria each and every day. What does that mean? What, what is 2,000? We've all had a pleasure in attending this Congress. And roughly speaking, we've got about 2,000 delegates at this Congress. So imagine that every single one of us got into the exhibition hall at 6 AM, and by 6 PM, nobody, empty. That's what we're talking about. We still got a massive problem on our hands. All right, Africa is the epicenter of mortality, certainly. 90% occurs here, 85% of the deaths occur in children under five, 
That's about half a million children a year. And it's one of the major contributors to us likely not meeting Millennium Development Goal number four, a reduction in the under five child modality. And it costs a lot of money, and we don't have a lot of that going around. Okay, so the epidemiology of malaria is quite interesting and important in the context of this particular topic. So if you look at it, there's a distinct relationship between your proportion of people susceptible to the various types of malaria and the age. And you'll see that severe malaria is clustered in the pediatric population, with the bulk of it being particularly in under fives. And as you get older, your susceptibility to malaria wanes, and that's because of the development of immunity. <clears throat> Particularly, we're talking about in an endemic area, because this is a graph coming out of an area of moderate transmission. So, this is another slide which talks about the difference in the presentation of severe malaria according to how old your patient is. So, as you can see, the very young, you have a lot of anemia, a lot of convulsions. You'll see that coma actually persists throughout the age range. And there's all very little uh, jaundice, and the involvement of the kidneys is low here. Okay? You'll see that acidosis is another factor that's consistent throughout. So we've also learned that the presentation of malaria depends on how much malaria is around you, okay? And if you look at this, as you're coming down, and so transmission of malaria is decreasing, you see that there's a shift in the type of presentation of severe malaria. So where malaria is extremely prevalent, severe anemia is the most prominent early. But as you get into lower transmission areas, cerebral malaria becomes much more significant, and the other thing to note is that in low transmission areas, the presentation of severe malaria lasts longer in terms of the age of your patients. So one of the effects of the changes that have been made in terms of the number of cases of malaria because of changes in the transmission of malaria is that the type of patient profile is changing. And especially for practitioners working in non-endemic areas, the kind of patient that you can be faced with may be changing as opposed to the traditional descriptions you might find in the text. So, in terms of my talk, what have we done? So, please don't misunderstand me. I wasn't trying to make light of the impact of artisanate. Artisanate represents a massive step forward in the management of severe malaria. In terms of artisanate, we're talking about a drug that has been shown to have a broader spectrum of activity against malaria. And I think this slide demonstrates it quite well. We're looking at the 48-hour the <laughs> asexual life cycle of the plasmodium falciparum. Um, and you can see that artisanate begins its activity much earlier than its predecessor, if you like, quinine. So it works across a wider range. It also has effect against the sexual um, forms of the, of the parasite. So it also helps to decrease the transmission of malaria. So it works broader. It also works much faster. Uh, it has a tenfold increased kill per cycle than quinine. Tenfold doesn't sound a lot, but what I'm talking about is that every 48 hours, quinine kills 1,000 parasites. Artisanate kills 10,000 parasites. It's a massive difference. And, the, and, and almost as, a, as an unbelievable bonus, the side effect profile of artisanate is better. It's also something remarkable in that the evidence for its use is extremely impressive. Two big studies conducted both in Asia, Southeast Asia specifically, and Africa. So the CACMA trial was the first, the results were published in 2005, and this was predominantly adult, but there were a good proportion of children in there as well, and the results were unbelievable, so much so that the 1,500 patients, or just shy thereof, of number of patients recruited is, was actually the result of the trial, trial being stopped prematurely because it occurred to us that it was actually irresponsible of us to continue using quinine in that setting. Uh, the ACMA trial then followed in specifically looking at children. As I mentioned, that's where the bulk of disease was. And the two trials, we saw quite impressive 
differences with regards to mortality, looking at 38% in the uh, aqu CACMAT trial and 22% in the uh, ACMAT trial. What that means is that the number needed to treat in adults are as low as 14 to save a life, and in children closer to 40. Uh, and that's very impressive. And you can see, for those of you that like forest plots, that the intervention, the sum, sum of multiple trials show that there's clear benefit for the use of artisanate. Okay, red slide. Um, we are starting to see the emergence of artis artemisin resistance, particularly to artisanate, in the um, Thai-Cambodia border. It's a very important uh, geographical location. The reason is that this has historically been the epicenter of the emergence of resistance to your traditional anti-malarial agents. And this has been shown so far not at a clinical level, but what we're seeing is that there's prolonged parasite clearance times. And because of there's, there's an increased risk of gamet gametocyte hema, there's a potential for increased transmission of resistance. And it's so being taken so seriously that the WHO have actually um, set out a plan, a strategy, two years ago to try and contain this problem. It's called uh, the Global Plan for Artemisian Resistance Containment. Okay. The second thing that I'd like to point out is that we've made some advances as far as diagnostics are concerned. <clears throat> uh, some investigators um, have tried to come up with clinical scores to help people in what are resource-limited environments to try and identify patients that are at risk of more severe disease. But the thing I'd like to spend a little bit more time about talking is the rapid diagnostic tests. So the one in particular is the plasmodium falciparum histidine-rich protein 2 test. Um, the reason why this, there's a lot of interest around this is that it's now available as a quantitative assay. And by using the actual numbers, investigators have found that it does two things. One, it picks up malaria. And it picks up malaria in a patient who may have a high sequestered parasite burden, which means that your chance of picking up the parasite on your peripheral blood smear is reduced, but it doesn't mean that your patient doesn't have significant burden of disease. So the first thing it does is it addresses that issue. And the second thing is, because there are, are differentiating numbers in terms of severe disease, it can tell you that for a patient who's got a, a level of more than 1,000 nanograms per mole, you're dealing with severe disease. But probably more importantly is that at lower levels, so people have looked at levels, cutoff points of 200, 150, and found that if you have low levels of your PFHRP2, the chance of the patient having severe illness due to a cause other than what is then likely to be asymptomatic parasitemia is very high. And this is important because there's a high concomitant burden of significant bacteri bacterial sepsis that occurs in patients with malaria. And what's important is that you need probably to give patients with severe malaria concomitant bacterial treatment, antibacterial treatment. And this test allows you to try and work out where you are. Okay, and the last thing I want to touch on is that we've learned a lot about the pathophysiology of malaria, severe malaria, and because cerebral malaria is so important, a lot of the attention has been actually in the context of cerebral malaria. And, and because we've learned a lot about the pathophysiology, we've come up with a few novel uh, therapeutic options aimed at trying to improve the outcomes for malaria. And uh, in terms of uh, adjuvant therapies, maybe the first one that we should talk about uh, is um, fluid management. We've seen the slide earlier today, and, and some authors in the malaria literature are now calling this the largest trial of adjuvant therapy for severe malaria. We can debate that. But what we learned is that in severe malaria, the, admission, the administration of fluid can give us a very poor outcome. And this we've seen before. We've seen that it happens also with ventilated patients with a tendency towards pulmonary edema. So we've learned that judicious fluid administration is an important part of the management of severe malaria. This is a slide talking about um, the advances in terms of the pathophysiology. I'm not going to go through it today, but I want to point out that what it's done is it allowed us to create points at which we think we can intervene in order to make a difference. The bad news is that some of the things we've tried already haven't really worked. But 
we're not we're not put off we, we're carrying on and so we've got a few novel treatments that are either at um, still in the lab or have moved on to animal models L-arginine peroxisome proliferative activated receptor alpha and gamma and CXCL10 antagonists I think the thing that's interesting here is two one is that these are not new agents they are agents used in other conditions the investigators feel that if we take agents from other conditions, what we can do then is maybe fast track their applicability for use in, in, in humans. The, the, the information that we're going to get out of it, I'm hoping, is going to change uh, the way we practice. Um, for those of you that may by any chance have pet mice, I can tell you that if your mouse does happen to get cerebral malaria, the combination of atorvastatin to artisanate is going to guarantee you 100% survival. Maybe, maybe a little while, in a little bit of time we'll be talking about people. And lastly, I just want to point out that there has been work in terms of a vaccine. This is the vaccine that's currently being trialed in seven African countries. Uh, preliminary data is available. I must admit it's not terribly encouraging. You're looking at protection between 25 and 50 percent, depending on the age of the patients. Uh, decisions will probably be made in the next 18 months, and uh, by 2015 we'll have a final decision.